Well, come on in, come on in. We appreciate you being with us tonight. God bless everyone for sharing with us tonight. We well, are delighted. In. In. We appreciate that you being with us. Turn on this volume. God bless everyone for sharing with us tonight. We are delighted. And we are delighted that you're sharing with us. This is the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses. And we are delighted that you have decided to share with us tonight. We have a special a topic, the beginning of our chat lines, come have a talk with us here at NCGCC. It is the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses. Share and like this page that you can invite uh, your family and friends just to share with us. Uh, brain. This is a brainchild of Dr. Ulysses Moyer. Dr. Ulysses Moyer, we want you to come in and, and tell us a little bit about our chats. I know that you're here tonight with us. Welcome, sir. Uh, we are delighted to see you. We know you have a special guest as well as a co-host. And I'm going to turn it over to you to share with us tonight who you have um, sharing with us and as your co-host. Dr. Moyer, uh, you are on mute, sir. I want to make sure you unmute yourself. There you go. I'm very sorry about that. Good evening and welcome, everyone. On behalf of the National Convention of Choirs, Gospel Choirs and Courses Incorporated, this is an opportunity that we have developed for communicating with our membership. Since we've not been able to meet in person for a number of years now in sessions, which is uh, the nucleus of how we evolve and how we get along in person, uh, we decided that let's hear from those persons who've been impacted by it. So we've invited special guests for these sessions that might share at different levels uh, their strategies and share those strategies with us so that we might be uh, able to use some of those things as we go through this new normal for all of us. But I'd like to welcome you. And we have a special guest tonight that I'm going to introduce after I ask our chairman. Our chairman of the board, Dr. Morgan, is on. I'm just going to ask him to bring us brief greetings, if you will, please. And then I'll get into the introduction of our guest, and we'll move right along. Chairman Morgan. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Morier and uh, Brother Rodney. I'm glad that the family is together again. Uh, appreciative to Dr. Morier for bringing to us the chat room and for us to chat together and gather information that all of us can benefit from it. We want to appreciate everyone who's been able to gather and to be a part of our sessions. And again, thank you for our special guests, our co-hosts, and everyone who's involved in making this uh, a possibility for us to come together. God bless you, and we're waiting to hear the information. Thank you, Chairman Morgan. My co-host is Sister Serena Blanco, and she's a coordinator for all of the chapters and the union presidents bringing us together. So she and I will be co-hosting together this evening. We have, have a very, very special guest who's going to be sharing with us this evening uh, in the person of Ms. Catherine Dehoney. She is the president and the CEO of Course America, one of the finest organizations, core organizations in the United States. And I can say that because it's based right here in Washington, D.C., and I know of their work. Catherine has a long history and she's going to be telling us more about it, but she has been with that organization for a number of years. And before that, she has been friends of the Kennedy Center, where she's been involved in fundraising. She has a wealth of resources and information that she can share with us. And immediately when I reached out to her, uh, I, I knew that she would be able to share those strategies because all of us have been at the same point, a new normal that we knew very little about but we've had to make it happen. So I'm going to introduce Ms. Catherine Dehoney. She is the president and the CEO of Course America Incorporated. And good evening, Catherine. We're just so happy to have you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. And I really appreciate the invitation, Ulysses. So we go back a little ways. I yes. Think that you're right. I think Course America, um, Melanie Garrett, Yes, the daughter Melody, yeah. of Joyce Garrett, the yes. minister, uh, music minister director at Alfred Street. 
That's Melanie correct. was our membership manager and yes. attended one of your meetings in Atlanta. And I think yes. in 2005, I think yes. that's right. That's correct. Yep. And then uh, we were very proud that Ulysses participated with Chorus America. Uh, we did a forum at Yale. Gosh, 2016. Time yes. has no meaning these days for me. <laughs> but in 2016, to talk about the chorus ecosystem and all the components of that for all of us who sing in choirs and choruses. So we, we really appreciate this relationship. So yes. I thought tonight what I would do is let me give you some quick background on Chorus America and what we do. And I wanted to show you some research that we've become known for about, well, in a nutshell, why people who sing in choirs and choruses are just really special people. And then I thought we should talk some about uh, what we've been seeing during the pandemic and what choruses are considering and choirs as they're coming back together and where you can find more information. Uh, everything from really in-depth research to just recommendations for best practices. So if that sounds okay, I'm gonna share my screen, I hope, if I do this correctly. So let me make sure I do this. Um, mm -mm 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 -mm. So let's see, share screen. And I, um, this is what I wanna do. Is that what I wanna do? Is it this? Okay, here we go. Do you see my slide? Yes. yes. Okay, we're off to a great start. <laughs> So very briefly, for those of you who don't know us very well, we Chorus America is uh, the professional development, research, and advocacy organization for the choral field. We're about 43 years old, and we're headquartered in Washington, D.C. Right now, um, my staff, we have a staff of 10. We are mainly working from home, sometimes coming into the office, sort of you know, easing back into it as the District of Columbia lifts its restrictions and all of us are starting to feel more comfortable. But, you know, we're sympathetic to, you can't just, you know, turn a light switch for that sort of thing. Um, I am eager to sit in on your conversation after my presentation, because I really want to know what you all are experiencing right now and uh, ways that Chorus America might be able to help your choirs and choruses too. So our mission, Chorus America empowers singing ensembles to create vibrant communities and affect meaningful change. That's it in a nutshell. And I think that's what choirs and choruses do. They can't help themselves. That is uh, just the nature of the work. Our membership uh, includes choruses of all types and budget sizes. So we have professional choruses, those that pay all of their singers, uh, large volunteer choruses, choirs, children and youth choruses, symphonic choirs. Um, Washington DC has quite an unusual number of choirs and choruses from as Ulysses will tell you. Uh, we have probably more choruses with budgets of more than a million dollars than anywhere else in the country. Yes. <laughs> so Chorus America has members across North America. Uh, we have about, right now we're serving about 7,000 conductors, board members, staff members, volunteers and singers, uh, music businesses. And everything we do is to try to strengthen uh, these organizations' abilities to uh, build their own strong organizations and serve their communities and provide the world with beautiful music. We have also been working over a number of years, we're not new to this work, to try to build a more equitable, diverse, accessible, um, inclusive choral music field. And we started internally. We've been working on with our board to have a more representative board of all facets of the choral field, um, racial diversity, age, uh, geographic region. Um, and we're very proud of our board. Right now we have 38 members, which is a large board. That's about as large as it's been in a long time. 
And uh, these are artistic directors, you know, conductors from all over North America, some of the finest in the country. We have board people who have been uh, presidents of boards. We have composers, um, uh, chorus administrators. They're a wonderful group of very involved, engaged, and supportive people. Uh, we uh, serve the field with all sorts of different uh, resources, including a magazine that we publish three times a year. We have a website with lots of resources and templates. Like you can just, we call it add water and stir. If you want a sample job description or sample bylaws or a sample fundraising plan or something like that. We have these kinds of things on our website and we have lots of articles and uh, resources, particularly right now around COVID. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. We also have conferences. We are hoping to be back in person <laughs> someday soon, but not until probably June of 2022. But for right now, we're doing online conferences. And the one coming up in June is June 16th to, 16th to 18th. And it has both um, live uh, webinars, live sessions, but also pre-recorded. And you can participate either way. You can uh, buy a pass to participate um, in the 16th to the 18th, all the sessions that they are being presented live, as well as access all the recorded content as soon as it's all put up online, or you can just buy a pass to the recorded content after the fact. So yeah, we've had great participation. We knew that above all right now with COVID, the important thing was to get information out to the field and to keep choruses connected and people learning from each other and um, giving access to the latest information because things keep changing uh, weekly, it seems to me. But one of the things I think Chorus America is known for it most is data. We've done a lot of research on choruses and uh, not only on how they operate, but also on the social and civic impact of choruses in America. And right now, I know all of us have to advocate for our choirs and our choruses in many ways. And we always do, with the pandemic or without the pandemic. It's important to know how to make the case for why your church choir is important. What's the work it's doing? Where is it contributing to communities? And this data that we gathered before the pandemic, uh, just we, we have highlighted uh, some important characteristics of people who sing in choruses. And I think right now, before we dive into the practicalities of reopening safely for COVID, it's, I think it would be fun for everyone to just go up to the 30,000 foot view for a minute and look at this research about um, how special choruses are and choirs and people who sing, all their qualities that make them very, very special. So this recent study in 2019 is available on our website. It tracked some trends from previous research, but it also looked at some new qualities, new characteristics of people who sing in choruses. Our very first study that we released in 2009 showed that choruses, people who sing in choruses are just remarkable contributors to communities and to um, uh, the civic engagement of their, of their of society. And it also found that children who sing together in choral settings also have stronger academic, social, and emotional um, skills than children who don't. And it puts them on a path to life success. So these messages are more important today than ever because they support the case that choruses are an important part of rebuilding our shutdown communities, reducing isolation, bolstering child development in a year that has just been awful for our young people with disruptions to school, to church and to their social lives. 
So I think it's just important to get all the tools we can to help um, communicate and be very careful as we communicate to our audiences and our uh, stakeholders. Um, and hopefully some of this data will help with that. So this research, we had more than 5,700 people respond to a survey and we compared it to 506 members of the general public in a marketing panel um, and 600 members of 62, age 62 and older. So one of the exciting findings is that there, there are even more people singing now than there were when we first did these studies in 2003 and 2009. So uh, right now it's about 54 million adults and children sing regularly in church choirs or choruses. And that's 17% of the US population. That is enormous and uh, a much higher percentage. It makes it one of the most uh, um, important participations, uh, public participation in the arts is through singing. And at a time when we're very disconnected from each other, it's just fantastic news that more people are participating in, the, in such a powerful community activity. It also showed that singers, um, it confirmed really that what we know, that singers give back to their communities in a huge way. They vote 90%, say they vote regularly in elections compared to 55% of the general public. Uh, singers run for public office more often than their fellow Americans. They give more generously. They volunteer their time more often and they're more likely to hold leadership positions. Uh, this point I think has been really important. Uh, we asked survey questions along to find, to get at uh, people's uh, willingness for tolerance and respect for diversity, for people who are different than they are. And not surprisingly, that singers show a much higher, oops, I went too fast, let me back up, a much higher level of tolerance and diversity. And 63% believe that singing in choirs has is a reason for their increased tolerance and um, uh, respect for diversity. And to me, uh, oh, the other important thing the study found was that the more people have sung in choirs and the longer they have sung in choirs, the more likely they are to be tolerant and respect diversity. And um, so to me, that means, you know, the raw material is there. We have these wonderful people, these wonderful citizens that are uh, I ideal partners uh, to work on issues related to social justice and advancing our communities. And this is interesting that uh, more than, you know, 76% of singers say they got their start in school by the time they were in high school, mainly in elementary and middle school. And this is through schools, but also through church choirs. So it's very important, our support for music education. Now I'm just gonna zip through a couple findings. We did a special look at the benefits of singing for our older choral singers. Um, so this, I love this slide that uh, compared to, um, uh, well, let me back up. It says uh, that choral singers say that uh, 65 years old and older, that choral singing helped them remain active, stay mentally sharp and be healthier longer. 69% of older choral singers, and this includes church choirs, report a very good quality of life compared to 22% of the general public. Singing brings joy and joy brings all sorts of other benefits with it. And 20% of singers of older singers say that they have had actual improvements in specific health conditions because of their singing and singing regularly in choruses. They, and you've probably seen in the news that the intersection of music and singing and the science of health and creative aging for our older citizens is a very big area of study. And so it's wonderful that choruses can contribute in this way 
to this important activity for our older citizens. And this was interesting. Of singers that had these various health conditions, um, they've seen improvements. For example, 45% of singers that have had voice disorders have said that singing has improved that condition. It's improved COPD or chronic lung issues, asthma, high blood pressure, um, heart disease, sleep disorders. So it's um, an all around good activity that we really wanna foster for our older singers. And then I always throw this in. We love data and this man always makes me laugh when I see his picture. He looks kind of grumpy to me, but I love this saying that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And I always find that helpful at my own board meetings and perhaps you'll find it helpful at your church meetings and your trustee meetings as well. So with that, let me stop sharing my screen if I can. I did, I think I did it. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dr. Dahomey, this has been absolutely great thus far. And we really appreciate you sharing with us tonight. I wanna jump into a couple questions as it relates to that many people are, are really wondering, they, they, are, they are pregnant with possibilities of what does returning to universities, churches, and in the midst of this year of the pandemic, can you speak first of all about the pandemic, how it has affected singing, mm -hmm. and uh, what advice would you give us as choral entities in returning back to our places of worship, our universities and campus. I know you have an array of people that we're on your board. We're going to talk about it in just a second. But give us some understanding of where we are in this world of this pandemic and returning to sing. Sure. Well, I'm sure a lot of this won't come as a surprise to you. When, when everything started shutting down last March, Chorus America was trying to figure out what's the best way to serve our members and serve the field. And one thing became abundantly clear was the confusion on the data about how COVID was spread was wreaking havoc uh, for, our, for our field. Well, and for everyone, but I think particularly in our field. But one thing that um, the, you may all have seen Dr. Uh, Moyes uh, being quoted in the New York Times article about the chorus out in Washington state where people became ill after rehearsing uh, and with their choir before a lot was realized about safety and COVID. They were following best practices at the time and then tragedy struck. What we learned quickly was that uh, and in part because of how wonderful that chorus was in sharing information and cooperating with researchers that the uh, COVID was linked to aerosolization, tiny, tiny, tiny particles in the air. And this led to all sorts of research on masks and the effectiveness of masks, on ventilation, on um, how uh, room size matters and how long choruses can stay in a room, how many people at one time. So all this information had to be sort of aggregated and pumped out. And that's one thing that Chorus America did. We have a website that is a resource page for COVID-19 information that you know dates back to the beginnings in early days last spring and is being updated all the time. And that is available on our website. I can put the link, I'll actually put a bunch of links into the chat in just a minute. Um, but what I'll tell you, so that's sort of the practicalities of the issue. And, and we saw two responses, and this is a big generalization, but it's kind of easy for me to think about it in these buckets. We saw panic and choruses just shutting down and not sure what to do and, and, and very wisely being as cautious as they possibly could be and ceasing all activity. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we saw choruses in denial that they were like, this just can't be, how can we not sing? We're gonna find a way. And in most cases they were, how can we be safe but still sing in person? And usually that came down to singing outside, masked and distanced. 
Um, that was one common way. And in between those two ends of the spectrum, we saw amazing innovation and resilience um, choruses using virtual, maybe they couldn't sing together very well because you can't sing on Zoom and there is technology becoming available that makes that possible, but it certainly wasn't easily available uh, really up until, it's still not easily available, but it is available this now. But um, they were doing things like just supporting each other. They were serving as a small group. They were serving as prayer groups. They were reaching out, um, they were doing food drives. They were supporting the community. Um, they were also uh, creating ways to help support children and youth in this very difficult emotional time that they were having. And in some way, and it, we saw choruses providing ways for creativity to express what was going on. Things like working with composers to write songs or write lyrics to music. Um, and then we saw some really interesting combinations of recorded performances with you know, uh, virtual choral performances and then even their uh, virtual recorded performances that became more and more sophisticated with beautiful graphics and um, a storyline. There was one Eugene Rogers did uh, with the Washington Chorus that had its, that is a 20 minute film really. But uh, so we've seen quite a variation in responses. Um, but I think the most important thing I, that we've seen is resilience that choruses are gonna sing, they're gonna get back together as soon as they can. And um, we've seen different ways, I think, for choruses to do that and to try to keep connection. Dr. Moye or Sister Serena, you had a question. Yes, I do. Not unlike your organization, NCGCC has, has chapters all over the United States and locale plays a significant part in what takes place involving COVID. When we come to you for support, do you have locale specific information that will guide organizations and choirs the best practices of that area? Mm. That's a great question. It's one of the things that makes this so tricky. On our website, you can find on this COVID resource page, which I'm feeling bad I'm talking about and not posting in the chat. Let me just do that, if you don't mind, so that it's not a myth, that there really is such a thing here. All right. Oops, I'm not sure that's going to even come up as a link, but there it is. Does that come up as a link? It if it's not, I'll try to find it. Um, <clears throat> there's So there are, there are tools out there where you can see uh, exactly what's going on in your county. Mm -hmm. But I think more importantly right now is any chorus is to be, is to look up your uh, jurisdictions, COVID-19 information, because as you said, everybody is different. Here, I, I live in the city of Alexandria, Virginia, and it's not exactly following what the District of Columbia seven miles away is following. And I'm not sure it's even following what Arlington, Virginia is following, which is two miles away. Um, I noticed this when I went on a walk, everyone was wearing masks still. And I was like, uh oh, <laughs> luckily I brought one. So um, it's very important. And uh, one thing we've learned is that it, a lot of the decisions that chorus leaders and choir leaders and church leadership have to make has to do with, you have to know your own stakeholders, your own congregation, the age ranges, the risk for serious illness, the how, how folks are feeling about vaccinations, whether they are getting vaccine, uh, vaccinated at a high rate, children that can't get the vaccine yet. So there's lots of um, decision points and considerations. And unfortunately, we, one size does not fit all. It never has. And boy, does it really not fit all now. And it's um, what we try to do is say, here's 
things to consider. Here's all the factors you want to consider before you decide to bring everybody back or before you decide um, the we can require everybody be vaccinated to sing in our church choir, for example. That's a decision you can make. Do you want to make that decision because of the people who are not able to be vaccinated or will not or cannot or have people at home or that they're worried about? So it's a lot to consider. One of the resources, and this is more uh, a resource that's more generally uh, tuned towards what our audience is thinking about coming back, but it's something to consider and um, I think there are parallels in uh, any large, large church congregation as well. Um, and it is a study that's being done by a gentleman named Alan Brown of Wolf Brown Associates. And I always say the name of this study wrong. It is, um, it is called the Audience Outlook Monitor Study. And what it does, it's surveying audiences here again. I hope I hope I get well. There's the website. The it's surveying regularly every month. This huge, huge, huge group of people who tend to go to arts performances, so um, theater and Broadway and um, choral music performances and go to museums and things like that to try to get at what do they need to feel comfortable to come back? What is the likelihood they're gonna come back in person? What, what do organizations and what do churches have to show that helps people feel comfortable to come back or help singers feel comfortable to come sing? So this is an amazing wealth of information. And basically right now it's showing that there are 40% of you know arts audiences, I, and I don't know the data for church congregations, but certainly in general, arts audiences, 40% right now who have been vac vaccinated are not ready to come back into a live audience. So now maybe with the next CDC announcement, that's gonna change. So stay tuned to next month's update because <laughs> it's all gonna change again but there's a large group that are just not gonna be comfortable. And um, one of the things on our COVID resource page is, what are the types of things audiences want to know? What do congregations wanna know before they will feel comfortable? They wanna know mask requirements, maybe seating distance, maybe that it's okay to wear a mask, that this isn't, you know, that it, you're gonna be welcomed and loved if you wanna wear a mask. Um, all these things, there's been such stigma applied now. It's gotten so political that, you know, messaging is very, very important. So it's thinking about it from both sides, really, the people up in the front and the people in the audiences. What do they both need to feel comfortable? So there are th considerations, toolkits for that sort of thing that we've posted online. And if you have Dr. scientists, Morgan. I'm sorry, please ask. No, Dr. Moya, you had a question. Well, no, no, she, she, you've answered most of my, in your talks, but I'd like for you to share specifically the classes that persons can further their study uh, about ways and strategies that will be coming forth during the conference. You might share those with oh. us for more information, right? Sure, I'd love to, thank you. We have, yeah, as part of our conference, we have, um, we've, We've got two uh, types of, we've, we've sort of categorized all of our sessions, either uh, around reopening and what choral groups need to consider. So that's things like the latest research and data from the scientists. We have one session that features um, three researchers who've been at the very, very cutting edge of, of all the research about singing safely in, and viral spread through aerosols and all that stuff. So what are they saying now, especially with the CDC's guidance um, for fully vaccinated people versus not fully vaccinated people? So we have a session with those three researchers. We have a session about legal considerations around vaccines. 
and privacy. Um, if you are going to require vaccination for your singers, then how do you handle that kind of information if they're sharing with you that they've been vaccinated? That could fall under some privacy regulations because it is health information. So we have a session focusing on those kind of issues. We have um, also some sessions that are talking about um, how do you think about going forward? Do you completely abandon your online work that you've been doing? Maybe not. It's a wonderful way to reach out to your choir alumni or to older singers that haven't been able to participate because they don't want to drive to rehearsals or um, international audiences. You never know who's going to be watching your performances. And how does that blend into in-person work? Because it's a whole new area of responsibility and work for many, many choruses to think about. We also have, um, we're also focusing quite a bit on how does the choral music field become more equitable and inclusive? And we have a wonderful concert that's taking place uh, Wednesday night featuring choruses from the Twin Cities, putting together a concert that's called Rising Voices and it's commemorating this whole past year of protests, Black Lives Matter, um, commemorating the death of George Floyd. And we also have a concert on Friday night that is going to be um, featuring choruses from all over North America, doing some really creative, wonderful stuff. So uh, yeah, so there's a lot going on. So that's June 16th to 18th. And the other thing, I'm going to do one more commercial because Ulysses opened the door. <laughs> we are so lucky that one of our board members who's now just left our board last year was Roland Carter. Oh yes. And, and Roland Carter, Dr. Roland Carter is one of my favorite people on the planet. And Dr. Carter gave us a commission this year and he has given it to us. It's a commission consortium fundraiser for Chorus America. He is writing a piece and we're making it available at a very low fee to any choir, any chorus that wants to participate. And, and the fees are all collected and they become um, support for Chorus America's services to the field, especially during the pandemic. And we have, uh, he's told us so far that the piece is in honor of John Lewis and it is in the style of a spiritual but it invokes modern themes of what we've all been living through this past year. So there is also um, more information on our website about that. And I can send uh, Ulysses uh, more information that he could all share with you. So, yeah. So what else can, what else should I address here? Did Dr. I? Just before we uh, wrap up that, tell us a, just a little bit about the title of your workshop. I know some people may have missed that. I know that, and tell us the dates and how they can get more information about attending. Sure. Okay, let me do, let me try to do this right and, and not cut myself off. I, you know, technology and I are not, not comfortable friends. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to put the link in the chat. The summer conference is coming up June 16th to 18th. And let me see if I can do this right. Aha, I think I did it. And it is, uh, come, it's, uh, this is where we will do live sessions. We will have these concerts streamed and uh, we will also have recorded content. You can just watch everything after the fact if you'd like. So there's information at this website about registration and the schedule. And if you have any questions, please uh, contact me or you can contact um, uh, Karen Castro. I'm gonna put her at chorusamerica.org. This is Karen's email. She is wonderful. And you can also talk to Karen about membership with Chorus America. One thing we're doing during the pandemic is a pay what you can membership. We've sort of, we, our priority is to keep everybody connected and informed with all the changes that are happening and all the safety considerations in about singing and COVID, everything from masks to the latest research on viral spread. Um, 
that is our priority. So um, Karen can help you if you're interested in joining. Uh, we don't want financial concerns to be an issue because we know everybody and church choirs and community choirs have all been hit so hard with uh, this. So we're both broadcasting on both Facebook as well as YouTube. For those who are sharing with us tonight, you're listening to Catherine Dehoney, who is the president and CEO of Chorus America. Her That website for more information about this conference is www.chorusamerica.org slash C-O-N-F, short for Conference 2021. Again, that's www.chorusamerica.org slash C-O-N-F 2021. If you want to reach out to Karen, who she just spoke about of as well, that's Karen spelled K-A-R-Y-N at chorusamerica.org. Just want to make sure those who are listening to us, that information is also being copied on the YouTube channel as well. So you can grab that information. Go right here, Dr. Honey. Okay. Ulysses, do you have more questions? Did I answer? Yeah, yes, you did. You did. And this has been a wealth of information that you've shared with us, Catherine. Uh, we're just so glad that you consented to be a part of this of chat with us. Uh, will there be anything regarding, because you, we know you have extensive background with fundraising, will any of those uh, sessions be offered during this conference or... Absolutely. <laughs> what would a conference be without sessions on fundraising and marketing? Um, we have, uh, yeah, we have a session about how to raise money from individuals, which people get worried about asking person to person. Uh, we also have session on um, uh, you know, doing campaigns and that sort of thing. So yes, absolutely. And we also have information on our website about fundraising. It's always everybody's top question. Right. Thank you. Serena, do you have another question before we ask other guests that are mm -hmm. on a Zoom call with us? If they have any questions, I see a lot of singers, Dr. Hopkins and others, you may just have a question that you'd like to ask. Ms. Dehoney, before we end the session with her, our vice, we have two vice presidents on the call. Also, Dr. Palmer and Dr. Shanks Lott, and we have uh, other musicians who are here who might want to ask something. Anyone? I, I do have a question. Um, the major connector between the choir is usually the choir director. Mm. And those people who get out into the community and encourage people to become members what information or guide guidance would you give to the choir director that can can enhance or secure the feeling of its membership what can they say to the to the choir members to make them feel safe hmm. that's a great question i think it's important for the choir director to listen and find out what the concerns are because it's not going to be one thing I've learned is it's not always what you think. <laughs> it's sometimes it's as simple as I just don't want to sit right next to anybody or could we break up rehearsal after 30 minutes and move into a different room, open the windows and move into a different room. It could be if it's COVID, that's the concern. Mm -hmm. The other concern may be something like, you know, I really don't want to drive at night anymore. So you just, it's sort of, um, uh, it depends really on what the primary concerns are. I think in general, if we're talking about, I just don't feel safe singing, I think it is important to show, um, to find out what it is, to talk about how uh, certainly the vaccine, the testing for the vaccine is all based on um, previous vaccine testing that was started in 2003 mm -hmm. and how safe it's been. Uh, what the CDC is saying about the safety, um, the, the likelihood of catching things if you are vaccinated is, is incredibly low, like being hit by lightning, low, very, very low. Um, but honoring folks that still want to wear a mask, and we, there are masks that make it easier to sing. They have a little more material in front. Mm -hmm. Some of them make you look like you're wearing a duck bill but there's some that aren't quite that bad. Mm -hmm. But um, I think being willing to work with your singers to make them as comfortable as possible um, and by just figuring out what those concerns are. Um, 
I know it's a double whammy, I think, for church choirs that really sometimes I get worried about even more. I sang in a church choir. Well, I've sung in a church choir all my life, really, until recently. And I noticed that the church choirs in general sometimes have to really fight for um, to because of the move over to praise music, the move over to song leaders sometimes has left church choirs behind and or has changed the emphasis. So I really feel for some music directors, for some choral music choirs, choir directors, that you're battling all sorts of things to, to get folks to participate. So that, exactly. Yeah, but it's I, I can speak from experience and I never had a more important uh, group support. I, I called it my small group, but it was about 60 people. This was a large church for me. And uh, that was my small group at church was my church choir. So I'm a believer, that's for sure, in, in the power of church choirs. Thank Dr. you Holly, so much. Um, especially in this series of pandemic, certainly it becomes very critical about communication. Mm. What You know, with working with choirs and organizations, communication certainly is a big part. In the midst of communicating uh, uh, pandemic, COVID updates, any nuggets of wisdom that you found, first of all, certainly being the president of such an organization, as well as choir director and, and those kind of things, what nuggets of wisdom can you share with us about communication, not just in yeah. general to our choir, but certainly in this pandemic season that we're in? That's, you know, I really appreciate that question a lot. It's, ah, wow. It's one of the challenges, I think, and it's something Chorus America learned, is transparency and communicate clearly and often. But I also think what helped us is to try to condense the center for communications down to just a few people because it can get really confusing out there, but who is it who speaks for the choir, especially related to COVID and the changing nature of uh, safety protocols that the, the just everyone will expect to hear from just a very small group or one person who might have a small group like a kitchen cabinet <laughs> that they're talking with about the next communication. But it's very important to have regular updates, even if you don't have much to say, so that your um, singers know when to expect they'll hear from you, that they're that it's if it's once a week, even if there isn't any more new news, or um, if it's just to give sort of an update on something fun that happened over a Zoom call um, or um, some sort of rehearsal technique you want to share, but some sort of regular communications and particularly around COVID related matters that it's, it's held to a very small leadership core doing that communicating. I know that you are no expert, so to speak, in reference to the timeline or the window regarding mm -hmm. turning a returning to full course singing right. in your um, board and, not, and, and you might want to tell us a little bit about the members who are on your board. I know they are wonderful people. I know many of them who sit on the board even currently now, but what is the word on the street as they <laughs> say? I mean, that's, that's the dying question tonight, Dr. Sure. Dr. Is when is it safe? That What's the word on the street as it relates to when right. is it when it's safe. Well, I'll tell you that the surveying we've done of our chorus members, the vast majority are not planning to have in-person concerts with, I mean, live audiences until around December, around the holidays with most shooting for January and for the season to start January, 2022. Hmm. Now, uh, again, that, that's going to vary depending on where you live and the prevalence of vaccines. Um, it's, but I would say oof, October is maybe even too soon that the way that the comfort level of folks coming back, except singing outside, that's a big difference. If people are very comfortable being outside, that's the data we're seeing. 
um, but into a building, it's, it's going to be harder. Now, of course, church is a little bit of a different matter, but because, you know, people want to worship together and that's a whole other level on top of wanting to sing together. And they're often the same thing. So uh, it may be different for church choirs. Um, they'll make a different calculus, but uh, uh, mostly we're seeing winter and, and maybe in time for the holiday concerts, for the Christmas concerts. Sounds great. Sounds absolutely great. First of all, I want to thank you for sharing with us on this time portion. Just want to tell you a little bit about what you're seeing tonight. Again, this is the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses uh, chat. Come have a talk with us. And you've been sharing with, uh, the, I call a doctor, Dr. Catherine Dehoney, who is the president and CEO of Chorus America. You do want to check out that website at www.chorusamerica.org. Um, and all of this is sponsored through our team seat, which is different teams within our convention, uh, spearheaded by Dr. Moye. Dr. Moye, I know that you're going to uh, say some words. Tell her, and I, before I turn it over to you, certainly there are members within our Zoom conference who's going to stay on just a moment and have a continued chat um, with Ms. Catherine as well. If you want to be a part of that, certainly you can write us and let us know at ncgcc dot inc again that's ncgcc dot inc at gmail dot com to be a part of this uh smaller chat that we're going to have but we want to thank you even now for sharing with us um uh, there is on youtube as well as our facebook uh channel dr moyer i know that you have other chats that are coming up very soon tell us a little bit about um who's coming up and uh um, when our next chats are scheduled Thank you, Rodney. We have one scheduled for June 15th, and our special guest for that evening will be Minister A. Jeffrey LaValle. We all know him, uh, renowned choir director, best known for his song, uh, The Lord is My Light, Salvation. So he is going to be our guest. And all of the guests that we've invited, because everyone has uh, a special experience that they can share, strategies, they have information. But most of all, it's good to hear everyone say that we were all caught at the same place. We all started at A, and we are trying to get to the end of that. So we've invited the guests again, secondly, so that we can hear from the membership, because without the membership and their support, we will not be able to continue to exist. So the initiative that we started with chat, come have a talk, was to hear from the membership because a lot of the things that Catherine has mentioned tonight, persons may have concerns and we need to hear that as leadership because without taking uh, our membership with us, we don't have any followers. So after being away uh, two years, we are hopeful that the results of these chats will give us data, give us information, where persons have shared their uh, personal opinions. We've heard voices that we normally do not hear from uh, we've reached into our chapters and unions to hear from those that may not be the leadership of that group. So we are asking you to join us in the future. Rodney has given that information. We are scheduled all the way through July with these chats. Uh, following that, we have Minister Stephen Hurd. We're looking at Minister Jason Claiborne, Jeffrey Golden. We're looking at uh, Brother Omar Dickinson, the call director at Hampton, Patrick Lundy and others to join us where they can share their expertise as Catherine has tonight uh, about ways of survival because it has been survival mode for all of us when you could not use the 35, 40, whatever those numbers are to come together in a worship experience in a choir, community or church. It was a different new normal for all of us. Uh, we've learned so much about technology. So Catherine, you have been a wealth of information resource for us this evening. We applaud you. We applaud what Course America is doing. I thank you for that great relationship that has existed between the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Courses and Course America since 2005. We've been a part of that and so many opportunities have been afforded through that organization. So we like to say this will not be the last opportunity that we'll be calling on you to share with our organization because you do have the data and the expertise that we all can use and benefit from. So thank you for sharing thank with Thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I'm looking forward to working with all of you. And uh, again, thank you for having me. 
Yes, I'm going to ask you. I, Thank I you so very much, Catherine. Truly an welcome. honor meeting you. You're yes. very welcome. Now, are there any questions from the other members of our leadership? I see Dr. Palmer will take one or two questions before we move into the last segment with our membership. Sure. Let me just close out. Let me just close out this particular session right here online. Certainly, okay. if you're sharing with us tonight, we want to uh, tell you to stay a part of us here at NCGCC. Uh, you can always find us at our website, ncgcc.inc.org, on our social media platforms at the same NCGCCINC, as well as on our YouTube channel. This program that you're watching tonight will be rebroadcast on our channels. Um, for you to catch these nuggets of wisdom as well. We want you to save the day. Certainly our, the national convention is on the move and we are excited about our virtual convention that will be shared August the 4th through the 7th, um, 2021, okay? Virtual convention, uh, we are still having our convention August 4th through the 7th, mark your date. That's under the leadership of our president who I know, give her a shout out, she's watching while we were on here tonight and she is watching us, Dr. Mary Beth E. Gentry. We appreciate her leadership and her vision for this convention. So check that out, stay tuned for more information about our upcoming convention as well. And we thank you for sharing with us as well. Like, share our pages that every time we go live that you can be a part of our convention as well. And we just say thank you for sharing. And again, if you wanna reach us, ncgcc.inc at gmail.com. May God bless you and enjoy your evening.